Hi, Kim. Thank you for joining me for Lead Time Chats. Thank you. It's great to be here. Good to see you. So uh, today um, we'll be talking about the topic of privilege and how to build more equitable workplaces. And uh, I'm thrilled to chat with you because I'm really fascinated with your path from, um, you know, authoring Radical Candor and to what you're working on now and your recently released book, Just Work. <laughs> Just Work. <laughs> uh, can you tell me a little bit about that journey and what led you to Just Work, both the book and, and your, your company? Sure, absolutely. So if you write a book about feedback, you're going to get a lot of it. And indeed, <laughs> I did. Uh, so and some of the feedback that really had the biggest impact on me was when I, I gave a presentation at a tech company in San Francisco. Uh, and the CEO of that company had been a colleague of mine for the better part of a decade, somebody I really liked and respected enormously. And, uh, and one of too few black women in tech. And she pulled me aside after I gave the radical candor talk. And she said, look, Kim, I'm really excited to roll these ideas out on the team. I think it's going to help me build the kind of culture I want. But she said, I got to tell you, it's a lot harder for me to roll this out than it is for you. And she explained that when she gave even the most compassionate, gentle candor, that she would get signed with the angry black woman stereotype. And I knew this was true. And it, it made me have sort of three revelations at the same time. The first was that I had failed to be the kind of upstander, the kind of colleague for her that I wanted to be. I had, I had failed to notice over, the, over our long, after, over our many years of working together, that she always showed up invariably pleasant and and it you know believe me she had what to be pissed off about in that period of time and mm -hmm. it had never occurred to me the toll that it must take on her to to have to show up that way at all times so that was number one number two was it made me realize her words made me realize that not only was it easier for me to roll out radical candor than for her it was more difficult for me to roll out my own ideas than it was for the men who I worked with. And, mm -hmm. and, and so I had been sort of in denial about the things that were happening to me as a woman in the workplace throughout my career. A hard thing for the author of a book called Radical Candor to admit. <laughs> uh, and then last but not least, it made me realize that I had often failed to be the kind of leader that I imagined myself to be, that I wanted to be. I had failed to create the kinds of environments in which everyone could just work and not get not get waylaid by nonsense. And so that was what really prompted me to write this the new book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I know Radical Candor is is a book that and framework that's that countless leaders in tech have found um, very useful for giving feedback. Um, and a lot of leaders in tech are men are white men, right? And so, so yeah, all so that is matching with men. You. Yeah, that's matching what you're saying. Um, and I, I know it's also faced its fair share of um, misunderstanding and, and criticism. So I'm curious for you personally, what did you feel like was left unaddressed with radical candor that you wanted to address in this new book? So I think the new book is a new book. Uh, it's like, you know, you're, if you have children, they're different. <laughs> and you don't want to compare the one to the other all the time. But the, the thing that I really wanted uh, with the new book to do is like one of the things that I love about tech is that people in tech are problem solvers. And so, the, and even though there's been lots of problems with inequity in tech, I, I also believe there's a, a really a good faith effort to solve this problem. And so what I wanted to do is to try to sort of parse the problem and break it down into its component parts so we could address each one discreetly and also so we could understand how the whole system works together or doesn't work, <laughs> leads us over the edge of a cliff. Um, so, so what I did was I sort of said, okay, we all want to just work. We want to create these environments that are optimized for collaboration. I think there's broad sp spread agreement that that humanity's superpower is collaboration. Uh, and, and yet so often we kind of go the opposite direction and wind up in these kind of coercive environments without intending to, but we wind up there. 
And we also want to create these environments in which everyone respects everyone else's individuality. Uh, and yet, too often, we wind up in these environments that sort of demand conformity, even though nobody really wants to work in a 1984-style environment where everybody's mar marching in lockstep. So what are the things that get in, in the way of this shared desire to just work? And I think there are six different problems. The first three are bias, prejudice, and bullying. These are the root causes, I think, of inequity in the workplace. And I think we lump them together too often and treat them as though they're the same thing. And they're not. Bias is sort of not meaning it. Prejudice is meaning it, uh, is a conscious belief. And bullying is just being mean. There's no belief at all. <laughs> the person's just being a jerk. And so the way that we respond as leaders or as upstanders or as people who are harmed by these attitudes and behaviors needs to be different depending on what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I really appreciate the, um, as someone who also did a lot of training for tech, uh, tech companies and tech leaders, I, I think that's absolutely right. You kind of have to break it down and, yeah. and people are like, oh, I can, you know, I can, I can handle this, this big kind of amorphous soft skills or whatever. Yeah. You can kind of break it down into frameworks and then people, yeah. it feels much more approachable. Um, going back to your mention of the three revelations, I'm curious, um, what was important to you about realizing the ways in which maybe you hadn't been honest with yourself about your personal experiences in tech? You know, I think uh, I never wanted to, to consider myself a victim, but even less did I want to consider myself a perpetrator. <laughs> Mm. And so as I wrote Just Work, I had to come to grips with both. So, so I talked a, a, a moment ago about sort of bias, prejudice, and bullying. So let's take a specific yeah. instance of bullying. Uh, I was at one point in my career the CEO and founder of a software company. And there was a guy who was working for me who was having some, who was struggling with a project. He was not. And so I was having a conversation with him about it. And at one point in the conversation, I said, as I always try to do, what could I do or stop doing that would help you get this project back on track? And he kind of leans in and he says to me, you are the most aggressive woman I ever met. That is the problem here. So, you know, we're in an aggressive industry and part of his job is dealing with aggressive people. And if I'm the most aggressive woman he ever met, I'm not even on the list of the top 100 most <laughs> So his problem is not really my aggression. His problem is my gender. And in my case, that's not going to change. And so, so what I should have done in the moment was to create a consequence for his behavior. That was my job as a leader is to create a consequence. But instead, I responded to that as though I were the person harmed. And I sort of chose to ignore basically his, mm. but the problem with that was that if he was going to treat me that way, how was he going to treat the women on the team who worked for him, who were junior to him? And I got the answer to that question, unfortunately, a few weeks later. So we talked about bias, prejudice, and bullying being the, at the root cause. Now, what happens when you add power on top of bias, prejudice, and bullying? And then you get discrimination, harassment, and physical violation. So here's what happened in this case where, where his, his, he was bullying me. It was kind of a discreet incident. But a few weeks later, company all hands, obligatory pizza at the company all hands. He's sitting on a table after the all hands is over, and underneath him is the garbage can. And a woman who works for him walked up with a, with a plate with a couple of pizza crusts, obviously needing to throw it away. And she says to him, I need to, and he spreads his legs and he says, get in between my legs. Just gross, right? But once again, I responded and I was standing right there and I responded to the situation, not the way a leader has an obligation to respond to it, but I responded as though I were the person harmed. And I kind of rolled my eyes and pulled the garbage can out. And the problem with my response as a leader is that, is that she did not feel protected. She felt like she was working now in a hostile work environment where he could get away with talking to her like that. 
And that was a big, like, that was a big problem. That was a big, pro and, but she didn't feel safe to come to me and tell me about this because I was the person who just sort of brushed off his, his comment. And, you know, when I started that company, I started the company in part because I wanted to create a good working environment for everyone. And I sort of assumed, well, if I'm in charge, you know, of course everything will be <laughs> sweetness and light. And it wasn't. So when I started the company, I focused very much on me controlling the co I didn't create checks and balances. I created control. And if I had created checks and balances, if there were someone else she could have gone to, um, or even if, if there was an HR person who had a direct line to the board, then, then it would have, then I would have gotten the feedback that I needed, but I didn't do that. And so it's so important. This is one of the things that, that I learned when I, years later, went to work at Google, which sort of, syst I'm not saying everything is sweetness and light at Google, but Google did do a good job sort of systematically, at least in the early days, systematically stripping away unilateral decision-making authority from leaders. And that meant that, that if, your, if your boss or your boss's boss was not doing what they should do, you had more degrees of freedom to, uh, to, 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 to respond. And that meant harassment, which does happen at Google, but it was, it was, it was, you had more degrees of freedom to do something about it. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I think it's really important when you, when you start a company uh, especially if you're a founder of a company, but when you're a leader of any sort to realize that you are designing these systems that are going to impact how people behave. And if you don't design the systems specifically for justice, you're going to wind up with systemic injustice. Yeah. And the, the story you just told, it reminds me of, um, a lot of leaders are often given the advice to praise publicly and criticize privately. Um, but it seems like this is a situation, especially when it comes to uh, these six, you know, the six topic of bias, harassment, bullying, and the other three. Um, there are situations where criticizing in public or cr criticizing in private and not criticizing in public and not having consequences in that moment really sends the wrong message or not the message you want to send as a leader. Yeah, exactly. I think when it comes to bias, you really need to have public bias interrupters. You need to create as a leader a norm of interrupting bias. Because if you remain silent in the face of bias, then you're reinforcing it without, maybe you don't intend to, but you are reinforcing it. And so this is an, uh, an exception to the, <laughs> it's not real, but you want to create bias interrupters that don't feel like criticism. It feels like sort of, you know, it's also okay in a meeting to point out a typo in public. You don't have to pull the person if somebody mm -hmm. has a typo on their side or something. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, you want it to feel like that. So there's sort of three aspects to bias interrupters. The first is you want to make sure that there's a shared vocabulary, that there's a, a, a word or phrase that the whole team knows. If somebody says it, bias has just, they've just observed some bias. So mm -hmm. Trier, my co-founder, and I use a purple flag. So we, we wave this purple flag at each other all the time. And a purple flag uh, indicates that either I'm waving it on myself because I've just said or done something biased or I'm waving it on Trier or Trio's waving it on me. And Camille, who also is it's a small team, just the three of us, but we all, we do this for each other. We, uh, and it's for each other. It's not to each other. Yeah. So there's a shared vocabulary. There's a commitment to use, to interrupt bias. There should be an expectation that bias gets interrupted once or twice in every single meeting. Uh, because it's it's manifesting, it's just we're often defaulting to silence. And then the third part of bias interrupters is that you want to help people whose bias is being interrupted know how to respond. Because this can be, this can feel like a profoundly uh, uh, hard moment it can feel profoundly shameful when your bias yeah. is like i did something wrong or yeah. i should have known better yeah yeah 
I, I can tell you how it feels for me when my bias gets interrupted. I the backs of my knees tingle. It's it's the kind of the same feeling that I get if I walk too close to the edge of a precipice. It's a physical sensation. And so learning how to respond when you get this kind of feedback is really important. Learning how to remain open to it. So you get one of two responses and both of them begin with, thank you for letting me know. And then the first is, I get it. I'll work hard not to do it again. And the second is, I don't get it. Could you please tell me after the meeting or drop a link in, in the chat in Zoom? So I think these are really important things that leaders can do to make sure that bias gets interrupted uh, as it happens. Now, bullying, you need to have, you really need to have consequences for bullying. And one of them is conversational. So you need to teach people and you need to learn yourself as a leader how to interrupt the bullying so that it doesn't go on, how to take the com take control of the conversation so that one person isn't taking up all the airspace. And for me, bullying, if bias, often you're using an I statement, I don't think you meant that the way it sounded or, or whatever you decide to use. With bullying, you wanna use a you statement. You can't talk to me like that. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that with bias, you want to invite the other person in to understand things the way you do. You do. But with bullying, you want a you statement. You can't talk to me like that. Um, uh, and my daughter explained this to me. She was getting bullied. She was in third grade. She was getting bullied on the playground. And I was sort of encouraging her to use an I statement as adults often do to kids. And I said, why don't you tell this kid, you know, I feel sad when you blah, 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 blah. And she bangs her fist on the table and she said, mom, he is trying to make me feel sad. Why would I tell him he succeeded? And I thought, gosh, that is a really good point. Smart so, kid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so with, with bullying, you want to, you want to, have the other person answering your question so or responding to you you want to be in the in in the in the in the active role not the passive role mm -hmm. um, whereas with prejudice you want to use an it statement uh, and an it statement sort of makes clear the line between one person's freedom to believe whatever they want uh, and another person's freedom not to have that belief imposed upon them. And this is tricky, but you can appeal to the law, you can appeal to company policy, or you can appeal to common sense. So for example, Trier Bryant, my co-founder was in a hiring meeting and everyone who uh, on the interview panel who interviewed all the candidates agreed the most qualified candidate was a black woman who was wearing her hair out naturally. And and the hiring manager, however, said, oh, we can't extend her an offer. And when Trier asked why, she said, well, we can't put her in front of the business with that hair. <laughs> and so an it statement could be, it is an HR violation not to hire someone because of their hair, or it is illegal, which it is in the state of California, not to hire someone because of their hair, or it is ridiculous not to hire the most qualified candidate mm -hmm. because of their hair. But that is the difference between sort of, if it's bias, not meaning it, you want to use an I statement. If it's prejudice, meaning it, you you want to use a, a an it statement. If it's bullying, being mean, you want to use a you statement. So those are things that you can teach your team to do in the moment. Yeah, I really, I mean, going reading your book, I really appreciate how it breaks that down because I think a lot of these, I mean, as you mentioned with your own story, a lot of these moments, you don't know what to say in the moment, right? And so yeah. having having go-to phrases or uh, indicator or interrupter um, just feels so important because it is important that it's addressed in the moment. Otherwise it's, um, you can kind of become complicit in whatever is happening. Yeah, and it's, it's important to understand the impact that, that your silence has. If you are the would-be upstander in your silence, so you're a silent bystander, 
this has this can really be upsetting it's you get slimed all of a sudden with someone else's bad behavior it wakes you up at three in the morning why didn't i do anything mm. and and that's it takes a toll on you and if uh, same thing if 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 these attitudes and behaviors are directed at you and you don't say anything at least i know over the course of my career that i started to feel a loss of agency because i wasn't responding and that takes a real toll. So you want to make sure that, you know, I think we're all naturally acutely aware of the risks of speaking up, but there's silence, mm -hmm. some risks with it as well. And so I think sort of doing a quick ROI analysis will often help you decide to speak up. Yeah. And I, I really appreciate the emphasis on creating a culture of upstanding and not passively observing because passively observing means you are actually reinforcing that behavior. Yeah. Um, and it creates an opportunity for people who perhaps have more privilege to speak up so that the onus isn't always on the people who are marginalized or, you know, on the receiving end of bias, prejudice, or bullying in some way. Um, in, in your work, what are some ways that you found to be effective to get teams or companies or leadership on board with, with uh, creating a culture of upstanding? Yeah, I mean, the, the bias interrupters is, is that we talked about a moment ago is really mm -hmm. one great way because now there's this expectation that, that you're gonna, you're, you're, you know, you're gonna say something. I think also there's a, there's a nonprofit called Hollaback and they have something called the five D's. And this I find really helpful as, as an upstander. So one thing you can do is you can say something directly. You can use your bias interrupter. You can use your it statement. You can use your use mm -hmm. statement. But it's also really crucial when, when, when upstanders are willing to, maybe they don't feel that it's safe for them to say something directly, but you can always go to the person who is harmed by the, the, the behavior and set and check in with them and say, mm. are you okay? Uh, you can delay. And this is really, really important. I one time was in a meeting, 500 people. The man who was introducing my team and me introduced one man I was working with, shook his hand, introduced the next man I was working with, shook his hand. And then I stuck my hand out and he like makes this ridiculously low bow, grabs my hand and kisses it, like kind of slobbering yeah. on it. It was so oh, gross. gross. I, I know. Um, and, and that was bad. But what was almost even worse was that of all those 500 people, not a single person came up afterwards and said, that was weird. And so now, you know, there's this element of gaslighting. If you don't go up to the person who was the harmed by the behavior, then, then they feel even more isolated. So that delay tactic is really important. So there's direct, there's delay. You can delegate. Maybe you're not comfortable, but turn to the person next to you and say, what, what can we do? You know, because mm -hmm. often in these situations, upstander, there's more upstanders and there are people causing harm. So <laughs> there's strength in numbers. You can also document. Uh, you wanna make sure that if you film the event that you make sure that you check in with the person who was harmed and that you're not using this um, documentation in a way they don't want you to. And then you can also just create a distraction. There's a great story in the Times about this guy called Snack Man who prevented a, a sexual assault on the subway by just spilling his potato chips everywhere. Um, so spill your coffee, you know, have a sneezing fit. Sometimes just creating a distraction can change the dynamic as well. Great. Yeah, I, I haven't heard of the, the, those five Ds, so we'll, I'll be sure to link them in the, in the show notes. Um, this has been great. So I just to end on a very tactical note, I mean, all of this has been extremely tactical, but for folks who are interested in um, building more just workspaces, whether or not they are in leadership or not, what advice do you have other than buying your book? <laughs> read the book, buy the book, but read it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but also JustWorkTogether.com is a company that Trier Bryant and I founded to help individuals and companies put these ideas into practice. Uh, 
And, uh, and Trier is awesome. She's one of the great people I've ever worked with in my career. She, uh, she was an officer in the Air Force, and then she was a leader at, uh, at Goldman Sachs and at Twitter, chief people officer at Astra and the rocket company. And also she started her own DE&I consulting practice. So in some ways, I'm as the I'm the writer and she's the the real practitioner. She'll she really um, has helped a lot of companies put these ideas into practice. Great. So um, I'll link just work uh, together. Dot, yeah. Com. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Kim. Thanks. For, Thank you so thanks much. For joining Take me. care. Enjoyed the conversation.